Greetings. Here we are in the middle of Shambhala, <laughs> in the precursor to Shambhala. Of course, we're in the middle of the, of the war, you know, like uh, the wonderful, uh, oh yeah, Bob Marley, you know, war, war, you know, he has, has a great song, you know, war. Stand up for your rights, you know. It's tremendous. Like we're in the war period before Shambhala and before the New Jerusalem, before the arrival of the Mahdi. Before, before the Kalki for the Hindus, they also were the tenth avatar of Vishnu. They have the same name, even Kalki. Shows you how strong, how totally interwoven Buddhism and Hinduism were in the ancient time. In their own apocalypticism, they also have Kalki, which they consider the tenth avatar of Vishnu. So that's really interesting, and and we might unpack that a little more. But anyway, here we are continuing with that from the last session, and we are going on with the creative effort. Realistic creative effort, and because it's realistic that the miracle of human life on this planet, which is amazing, if you watch any of these big bang TV things on Nova or anywhere, you know, the ascent of man or all these kind of shows, all you have is a bunch of rocks banging around, a bunch of supernova explosions, a bunch of like molten lava flying around the cosmos in empty space with no air, and then somehow oxygen gets produced and carbon gets created, the planet cools down, and then, although it's still boiling in its core, with, la with, with liquid lava in down there, like boiling away, uh, God only knows how, much de how many degrees, and it's the burning sun is out there and it'll blow up in a couple more billion years, and, but anyway, temporarily, there's this little skin of the earth and the ocean, and then the air with the plants, and then the upper atmosphere, just a couple of miles thick, the whole thing, and creating this little slime pit place where life as we know it, biological life like the human being, an aggregate of many micro beings that we are, made of many bugs, they will say in the ancient languages, many micro beings can breathe, and the plants can use the carbon we exhale, and we can use the oxygen they exhale, and this very sensitive, delicate, exquisite place of being connected with others in the human level way that has its heavenly side and has its hellish side, and it, we become responsible for creating that. It's a miracle that we have that. Once we have such a, and definitely, although Buddhists at least do not, and I believe actually all spiritual traditions, although they, now they talk about God Almighty and they act like God is omnipotent, I think God himself, through the various scriptures like the Jewish Bible, the Christian Testaments, the, the Quran, the Hindu Upanishads and things like that, the gods themselves are always saying, actually guys, you also have some agency. We need you to be ethical. We need you to be kind to each other. We need you to take care of things and be the steward and custodian of things. In other words, they kind of disclaim by hint that omnipotence that is attributed to them in a fantastic manner. And I think this sort of emphasis on omnipotence among them really comes from kings who, and generals, who are really generals, right? Military generals and kings in this recent thousands of years of history who want the citizens to think the king is omnipotent has power of life and death over the citizen to make them behave themselves. So they want to enhance their power by, have, by creating spiritual traditions that sort of compromise the idea of the individual's ability to realize knowledge, the individual's ability to be responsible and kind and, and by, by saying, we have all the power, so you just have to do what we tell you, so we don't have faith that you can yourself be the king of yourself. <laughs> and control your own unruly emotions and, and, and impulses and so on. We don't believe that, so we think you need to think there's an absolute power on top of you making you do it. And then, and you can, and then of course, never mind that you're going to hate that power when horrible things happen to you, because of course you're going to blame that king and that god. But never mind, we won't, your blame won't bother us because we will just kill you if you blame us too much. So this is the mistaking the mistaken perversion, I think, of the spiritual traditions, which are all founded by people 
like Moses and Jesus and Confucius and and um, uh, Buddha and Yajnavalkya, the great and Patanjali and etc. Uh, and who taught beings that the human has to have their own responsibility, and they create they are they have an interactive hand in making their lives and shaping their own lives by some kind of karma or evolutionary theory. So I think that's very important when we realize if we realize that in spirituality. But on the other hand, that this is the way it is, there may be very powerful angelic beings. It doesn't mean there are not deities who are very powerful to shape things and to sort of create and design and like architects, you know, they take other materials. They didn't create the architect doesn't create the wood or the steel or this and that, but they use the materials to shape a beautiful house. So it's beings that are stronger than individual humans, probably angels and whatever you want to call them, definitely had a hand in shaping this planet and they're not going to let us wreck it actually. Uh, that I'm confident about. Anyway, even though there's no one who can be blamed for any wreckage. Okay, so we're coming out now. Tantra, coming back to reading here. Okay, with that introduction. Tantra began to come out of secrecy in India by the middle of the first millennium of the Common Era. By then it was safe enough as the land had become somewhat monasticized, that is to say demilitarized, and thus demilitarized, and educated and educated. Women were more appreciated and treated better, though still not equal. At any rate, more people were able to seek beauty. Larger masses of people could feel greater individual energies and remain gentle, turning to education, art, and culture, to undo emotional and neurophysiological armoring, and to lessen the emotional plague of psychological constriction, frustration, and cruelty, and traumatization. Such was the progress of the cool social revolution throughout Indic history since the Axial Age, which was the time of Buddha and the Upanishads and Patanjali and Panini and all the Sutrakaras, as they're called, in Indian history. As can be felt at an Indian Raga concert or in Bhakti devotionalist chanting, Indian societies had become more relaxed and organized by then to allow more people to be vegetarian, to let the heart feel easy, surrender more easily to realities, and be vulnerable and open to joy in both earthly and spiritual ways. They were still the monotheistic authorities, still their military thing, still too much in, of the grip of that, but the psychonauts, what I call the navigators of the of the subtle realms of the psyche, the great adepts, the Mahasiddhas, were so powerful as individuals that they were able to take all three vehicles, the individual vehicle, the universal vehicle, and the diamond apocalyptic vehicle levels of creativity, from India to Tibet, Japan, and Indonesia, where they might be preserved through the second millennium ordeals of barbarian conquests and invasions and regressive authoritarian social style, initially by the massive expansion of the Islamic world and then the massive expansion of the Euro European colonial worlds. The difference between them being that the, that the Islamic ones, the Islamic conquerors kind of settled down on top of the Indian society. They didn't really bother that much to go to China. They did go to a little bit to northwestern China, but they didn't try to invade. China was always a little insulated from all of these things, very interestingly, <laughs> in the eastern part of Eurasia. Uh, but um, although Buddhism went there because it went nonviolently by a soft power, you could say, through soft power. But, um, but they never got conquered completely, so to, so to speak. And um, uh, but everybody else did, and the, the European ones took the wealth away to Europe, whereas the Islamic ones just settled down and they became the elite and they circulated it within, built their Taj Mahals and things like that within India. Uh, so, they, so in a way their damage was somewhat less, actually. The Europeans made the railways to extract all the resources that they could, and, um, which they needed. Europe was relatively the poorer part of Eurasia, in fact, you know. 
It had less uh, rich river valleys. The Danube was really the only really big one in Europe. <coughs> okay, so uh, in the 1300 years of the Tibetan mainstreaming of the open-hearted, gentle culture, we can see a number of 11-generation, two-century-long steps of change. First, the emperors brought in the monastic universities, taming the warrior fixations holding up the conquest society, using top-down authority to educate the people, thus undermining the strength of their own top-down authority, paradoxically. Then there was a period of atavistic resistance to the more peaceful culture, which shut down the monastic universities, though it couldn't stop the grassroots dissemination of the new education of the nonviolent, more peaceful, more beautiful education. This period from circa 840 to 980, during which the empire collapsed, was poorly documented, but the tantric yogi psychonauts were surely active underground with lay practitioners. Uh, then regional kings teamed up with monastic university abbots for a couple more centuries, 980 to 1150, during which time the spiritual leaders became so powerful that they led the entire nation's response to the Mongol Empire, which happened, started in the 12th century. In the period from 1150 to 1390, the new generations of adepts began the process of extending the taming or civilizing process to the wild Mongolian conquerors, while getting the Tibetan lords themselves more and more used to not having much military power, since under the Pax Mongolica, no one could challenge the Mongolian armies. The next step was mass monasticism spreading over the entire plateau from 1400 to 1580, with the huge monasteries serving as transformative universities for creatively educating larger and larger numbers of people in the sciences and arts derived from the curriculums of the great Indian monastic universities. This period, which were preserved although they had been destroyed in India, this period culminated in what can only be thought of as a kind of reverse reformation in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, when another overwhelming Mongolian force helped the great fifth Dalai Lama make Tibet's own aristocratic militarists finally succumb to the monastic universities, allowing the head Lama of all the biggest universities to take responsibility for ruling the whole plateau. This resulted in the great fifth building of the Potala Palace, the extraordinary palace that is seen near, near the old town of Lhasa, but now within Lhasa, and the Tibetan people coming to feel that their savior figure, the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the multi-syllabic Buddhist Jesus, <laughs> except with many bodies, one difference being having many embodiments, both female as well as male, was committed to a continuous human reincarnation as their political as well as spiritual leader. This was the nature of modern post-17th century Tibet, where the Buddhist education movement became the mainstream focus of human lives, and everything was rationalized around that individual evolutionary purpose. This does not mean that everyone became enlightened or that Tibet was Shambhala or Shangri-La, far from it. There were many unenlightened Tibetans, many imperfect people in the universities, and considerable complacency in the spiritual communities. But everyone, however imperfect, did understand that the main purpose of life was to advance as individuals toward Buddhahood and help others as in communities to do so. That many individuals had in fact achieved that goal, so it was very doable, and that it wasn't just somebody in the past did it, but anyone could do it, and that any individual who made the full effort could do so successfully. Therefore, all individual and social creativity was aimed that way, however unsuccessful as far as the total of everybody following that aim, directly or indirectly. Thus, in the monastic university and in its advanced tantra colleges and postgraduate retreat community institute institutes, Creative effort went beyond educating the conscious mind to see the beauty of the Buddha land and, intense, and intensify the awareness of the immediate presence of nirvanic experience in the here and now. Many individuals put their effort into the internal science 
of tantric transformation, contemplatively de deploying yogic arts to dissolve what the pioneering Western psychologist Wilhelm Reich called individual emotional armoring in order to open toward the blissful fruition of Buddhahood for the sake of all other beings within their field of artful activity. The tantras creatively used a neuroscientific patterning of the central nervous system into a subtle body system of channels, energies, and neurochemical essence drops. The yogi practitioners had already realized the plasticity of all identity structures through the physics of voidness and relativity, and so could regularly shift out of a coarse body self-identity into a subtle body of patterns, circulatory energies, and fluids in order to consciously, lucidly traverse the layers of consciousness from waking to sleeping to dreaming to life, death, and the between state the bardo, famous bardo, and the conscious reincarnation process, or rebirth, reincarnation or rebirth process. Thereby they followed their Indic psychonaut ancestors and mastered the dying process to learn to die lucidly, like you can learn to dream lucidly, they learn to die lucidly, without actually harming their coarse bodies, I'm sorry, rehearsing the whole range of near-death experiences without actually harming their coarse bodies, traversing the luminous and radiant mind states reachable by contemplative adepts in order to fully transform their unconscious, the Eros and the Thanatos and the Aletheia deities of lust, hate, and delusion. They probed even beyond into the subtler, super subtleties of the clear light energy field wherein death is experienced as the essential energy of life. They carried the Indic researches even further than the Indic psychonauts had been able to do due to the relative isolation of their high plateau and the sheer numbers of practitioners relative to the small size of the population. The amazing creativity they thus unleashed reflected on the popular level in the famous misnamed Book of the Dead literature, which enabled quite a, which really means the Book of Natural Liberation is what it actually is named. But anyway, we Westerners call it Book of the Dead, which enabled quite a number of people to reach Buddhahood itself. These practitioners obtained their adaptability to embody themselves without feeling apart from the clear light of the void. No expression can encompass this clear light of the void. It is super subtle at a level where there is no duality of body and mind, where super subtle mind is the same as the super subtle body in the plane of inconceivable subparticulate energy, wave particle non-dual energy, welling up on demand from the super calm, inexhaustible, infinite clear light energy. This is the quiescent but inexhaustible fountain of true creativity available to a Buddha, a being who is the conscious agency for shaping coarse realities of embodiment into forms of blissful beauty. So creativity thus emerges in Buddha land building is the, is the heading now as we go on. There is a story that illustrates the creativity I am speaking of as taught, oh, I'm getting here to Vimalakirti, how great, as taught in the Vimalakirti teaching discourse. The discourse texts, that's sutra, I'm translating as discourse, because that's what it is in, in Buddhism, sutra doesn't necessarily only mean a string of aphorisms like in the Yoga Sutra, Patanjali, that is one form of sutra. But in the Buddhist thing, a sutra is just whatever a Buddha says. It's the discourse of an enlightened being whether in an in a aphoristic form or in a, a more discursive form, either one. And Bhimalakirti is like that. The discourse text begins with the Buddha residing in the mango grove of the famous actress Amrapali outside the wealthy Indian city of Vaishali, sort of the L.A. of ancient India, and that's Hollywood. A group of yuppies come out for a visit and are moved to offer their jeweled parasols, you know, sunshades, where when they enter Buddha's field of easy presence. Buddha then does a piece of performance art and fuses the parasols into a kind of planetarium, is all I could think. I couldn't figure out what it was for a long time as I was translating it, which surrounds the audience, but also it surrounds the whole galaxy. 
and imparts a vision of the total interconnectedness of the galaxies and the universe and the planets and the tapestries of alternate universes and all their heavens, mountain ranges, continents, oceans, river valleys, towns and cities, heavenly and earthly and underground animal realms and so forth. The youth are amazed at the vision and sing Buddha's praises in very intelligent verses. They then ask the Buddha the creativity question. They say, O oh, blessed one, we heard your teaching. We are already on, we, we have heard it, and we are already on our way to unexcelled perfect enlightenment, awakening and enlightenment. We want to really know everything and be there with total wisdom and therefore total compassion and altruistic love and creativity for everyone else. We want to do that. We want to be, we are bodhisattvas. We have the bodhisattva motivation to learn the worldview, the ethicalities, and the meditational realizations. But what we, do, what we still want to know, and which we're having a problem with, is how do you create the Buddha verse? How do you make it beautiful? In other words, we can change ourselves, we think, yes, to become an enlightened being on our minds. But how do we change this whole huge world? We can't figure that out. So Buddha then first responds that it's impossible to build a Buddha verse or a Buddha land because all is empty. But that is why a Bodhisattva goes ahead and builds one, because it's impossible. It's impossible because everything is relative. And even a Buddha land is illusory. Here we must remember that whenever a Buddha negates something that seems real, such as your eye or ear or nose, he is only negating its intrinsic reality, its absolute, disconnected, self-subsistent reality, not its relative presence. Yes, you have an eye that is interactive with what it sees and with the brain that interprets that seeing and the nerves and the whole kind of complicated thing. It's not a thing in itself, disconnected from everything else is the key. That's all that emptiness means. It's emptiness of being a disconnected, absolute thing. That means it's lacking an intrinsic, it's free of an intrinsic reality. It has only a relative reality. That's, that's the key thing of what emptiness means. That's why emptiness means relativity. We just have to remember that. That's why it's impossible, because when they're first saying a Buddha land, they're thinking, oh, this is an absolute non-Buddha land of suffering, and there are ticks out there, and there's lions and tigers and wolves and coyotes and whatever. So it's dangerous and dangerous, red in tooth and claw. And then we want to make an absolute Buddha land. But he's saying that's impossible. This is not an absolute land, and that is not an absolute land. They're just relative. And this is actually a Buddha land, he's going to later say. But he's just preparing the way there. So then he proceeds to teach that the world here and now is already a Buddha land. That's what Buddha starts teaching. When they, he says it's impossible, but that's why we do it. And then he proceeds to teach that the world here and now, and then he's thinking fifth century before the common era in India, He's saying it's already a Buddha land. It already is. I just was talking to an Indian great enlightened person, a Swami. He wasn't a Buddhist. And I was talking about the coming of Shambhala and, the, and the, the recognition as a broad public recognition of this as a pure land, as a Buddha land, as an exquisite place of bliss and freedom. And I said I, in the 60s I thought it would manifest like that next week. <laughs> and... I was frustrated it was still having these ridiculous wars and violence and slaughter and killing going on. And he said, well, I can see your point and I agree with you. And in fact, he said, in the way I think about it, I think it should have happened last week. <laughs> so, put it for it should have happened 2,500 years ago. And it did happen, actually. But people still refuse to know it. And then the bad kings and the generals and the dictators and the tyrants cause hell, they create hell, they make hell. So then he proceeds to teach that the world here and now is already a Buddha land, it's in that sutra. It is the one Shakyamuni has already built, because in other words, you can't abandon beings, so you have to change their whole world and all of them when you change yourself. And, he, and by changing his relationship to time, that's why Kala Chakra is so key, because then the machine of time, you give them time, in other words, however, to change their misknowing into knowing. So they know with their bodies, you know, instead of misknowing with their bodies, thinking they're some separate alienated thing, you know. But, you know, so after he finishes his description, oh yeah, then he says, it is the one he already built as a theater 
in which beings can find the optimal conditions for evolving toward their own enlightenment, freedom, and bliss. After he finishes his description of that land, which is this land already 2,500 years ago, he's challenged by Shariputra, one of the foremost of his dualist individual vehicle disciples, in response to which he bestow, he's challenged by him saying, well, wait, this place sucks, and I can see it looks terrible. There's poor people starving, there's wars, difficult things. 2,500 years ago, a lot of difficulties. So what's the Buddha land about, it says Shariputra. And you must have not done a good job building this Buddha land, Shariputra wants to say. He doesn't really say it because he wants to be polite, but he thinks it. So then Buddha says, he says, uh, Shariputra, is it the fault of a blind person that they can't see the sun and the moon? I mean, it's, no, it's the fault of the sun and moon that a blind person can't see them. And he says, no, no, it's not the sun and the moon's fault. They're shining there. The blind guy just can't see it. Well, that's the point. He says, you can't see that this is a perfect land because you have a spiritual blindness about thinking this is a horrible place and you have to leave to go to nirvana, He's basically. So but anyway, in response to which, the Buddha takes his foot and he, leans, he takes it down off his whatever chair he's sitting in, a throne or something, and he touches the big toe on the ground, it says. And then suddenly, everybody there suddenly sees the whole world around themselves as perfect. And they see themselves in the exact best evolutionary spot to develop their deepest love and compassion and wisdom and, and, uh, and uh, insight and clear light, clear light flow of uh, reality. They temporarily just see that. He, he creates a kind of miracle in which everyone feels the grace of themselves and everybody else and the whole environment being just perfect for everyone. Although in, a, in, a, in each case in a relational context with which is ideal one for them to expand to where they become equal to the Buddha. So he, disposed, he bestows that momentary vision of this land as an ideal teaching environment and learning environment. The creativity of a Buddha's compassion is thus presented as being able to transform the whole environment, not just the interior of the individual. A Buddha land in a Buddha verse is thus designed to provide beings with the perfect evolutionary situation to maximize evolutionary achievement of their lives, with the human life form being the most sensitive and in intelligent and malleable of life forms, capable of using such an environment in the most effective evolutionary way. Imagining the world to be like this puts people into a sense of empowerment. Yes, I can. I can do it. I can evolve. I can understand emptiness. I can realize it. And the relational self as a continuous work of art. I can make the creative effort to make everything more beautiful and build, purify, and transform and adorn the world into a Buddha world. This is what happens when you have a sense of the axiality and centrality of yourself in the Buddha, Buddha's omnis omnipresence, in the omnipresence of all Buddhas, in the field of all the Buddhas. After all, a Buddha is defined as a reality body. Her, his real body is all reality filled with both animate and inanimate beings and things. So she, he feels totally responsible for the misknowledge created world with its creative gods and every kind of being, all tending to suffer under the power of not knowing that the real world is the uncreated primordial nirvana play of bliss, freedom, indivisible. She and he exercise his or her responsibility spontaneously and effortlessly, opening her or himself as a portrait, as a portal of the infinite energy of relativity to energize all beings and things everywhere to become creative themselves discovering their own wise and skillful love power to enjoy and offer beauty to whatever degree they can and the environment around them can bear. Another way to think of this form of creativity is to consider people who perceive the world as filled with horrors. They are simply projecting the horrors of their own misknowing and addictive and trans. And trans traumatized minds upon the Buddhaverse of natural perfect beauty. Of course, mystics of all traditions in this world and also many simple persons in their inexpressible, astonishing, deeper experiences of grace and blissful communion, all intuit this reality, calling it by whatever names are available in their cultures. 
The experience of communion within the reality body of infinite wisdom and love does not belong to, quote, Buddhism, unquote, at all. This change in view encourages creativity within one's own mind, where one can bring into focus the wisdom and ethical super-education activated at this point. When you turn your awareness inward, you begin to see reactions and habits with distracting and negative thoughts bubbling up out of you don't know where. This is when you can turn your creativity to editing those thoughts and finding the wellsprings of wisdom, love, compassion, and beauty in your own mind. This then brings you into the region of remembering, also known as mindfulness, which is exploring your conscious, unconscious boundary to become fully and totally conscious, hence able to steer your mind and through it your actions into better and better joyful creativity. So once the creative energy of your own mind focuses on the seminal, super subtle realm accessible only by the coarse, subtle and super subtle mind, you turn to the third super education, this education in mind and in samadhi, the super normally empowering mental concentration that reshapes the world into continuous, beautiful, loving art by reshaping the mind into the bliss overflowing awareness that lovingly enfolds all embodiments. So we'll begin with realistic memory or mindfulness. So that's enough today. And thank you so much for being with us. And uh, I kind of like that passage. <laughs> I always like things connected with the female Kirti Sutra, which I do recommend. There are, there are other translations than mine, but mine is better. But never mind, they're all good. And I really like them. I recently received the translation. I really need someone who knows Tamil because I recently received a translation into Tamil from my English translation by someone. They didn't have the Sanskrit or the Tibetan available to them at that time. And uh, I hope it's good, but I don't even know the alphabet of Tamil in the South India, beautiful language of South India. So I can't evaluate it. But anyway, that's great. I'm glad they translated it. So anyway, by the ver merit of this, may we all soon become Kala Chakra Buddhas, and may we find everyone's freedom and bliss whether in their present or future or past, and help, and help maintain a, an environment within which they can optimize their progress toward that and toward the discovery that it's already here. <laughs> the big anticlimax of enlightenment. May they enjoy it fully. And so we dedicate the merit of this class and this chapter to that. And I'll see you later. Take it easy. Bye.